えー、それではいよいよ待ちに待ちましたファイスト博士にご登壇いただきます皆様大きな拍手でお迎えください Professor Ida,、uh, all the community here in Japan,、uh, dear academic colleagues from university,、uh, all of you participating here, thank you very much. It's a big honor for me、uh, to speak here for the first time in Tokyo, Japan. So I'm going to,、uh, to talk about the development of the、uh, passive houses. Uh, which mainly took place in Europe. And what you see here in the first slide, these are some examples.、Um, these are、uh, passive house social housing projects, which h a s been built in Kassel and in Innsbruck. This is、uh, another、uh, project in Innsbruck of、uh, passive houses. All of these buildings are passive houses, and these are passive house office buildings. So、uh, there are already a lot of. Uh, of um, Of built passive houses uh, which uh, are being occupied uh, at, the, uh, at the place uh, in uh, Europe. You go to the next slide, please.、Uh, so, this is、uh, an information from the International Energy Agency.、Uh, this is the agency which is responsible、uh, worldwide for the research in energy resources and for. Uh, looking uh, on the development、uh, about energy worldwide.、Uh, so, the International Energy Agency has always been in favor for the big industry model of energy, for coal, uh, uh, gas, natural gas, and oil. And uh, now uh, we are publishing what we call the World Energy Outlook every year. And there was a surprising result in.、Uh, The last World Energy Outlook, because this is what, what the International Energy Agency now tells us about the global trends in energy supply. They are patently unsustainable, not only environmentally, also economically and socially. So, this is what the, energy, what the International Energy Agency is talking about. But they also say, There is still time to change the road we are on. And they say what is needed is nothing short of an energy revolution. So now let us、uh, have a look.、Uh, how could that energy revolution look like? Next slide, please.、Uh, and the next, please.、Uh, the next. I, I, I would like to turn it myself if that's possible.、Um, so what you see here. This is、uh, my dear friend and、uh, co worker,、uh, Professor Bo Adamson. Uh, uh, you have already heard of Professor Bo Adamson. He was also the host of uh, Professor Kamata,、um, uh, who has been working together with him for quite a time at Lund University. So when I met、uh, Professor Adamson, that was in 1985,、um, he just had an appointment. With the Chinese government. So we ha- he was asked by the Chinese government to come to China and to give advice to the government. So, why? Now, in China, they have had energy supply problems all the time. So, in southwest China, all the region south of the Yangtze River, in this part in China, heating was prohibited. So, people were not allowed to heat their buildings. Uh, but the comfort in these buildings was very poor. So they suffered from、uh, very cold temperatures, which could be down to 10 degrees, 11 degrees during winter. So the government asked Professor Adamson to, to give some recommendation what they could do in order to improve the comfort in these buildings. And so he called these buildings passive houses because they didn't, they didn't have an active heating system. So, this is where the passive house comes from the passive houses without heating system. So, government asked him to improve 
the indoor climate in these buildings without adding a heating system. So, and this is what he did. So what he did is he recommended adding some more insulation. He recommended using double pane glazing. He recommended to tighten the buildings a little bit. So he came up with a concept for comfortable passive houses in southwest China. And then Bo Adamson came back to Sweden. And the first guy he met was me. And his mind was full of passive houses, passive houses, passive houses. What about building passive houses in Europe? That was his suggestion. He wants to build passive houses in Europe. And my thought was at that moment, now he's gone crazy. So I, I wasn't his opinion, so it was difficult for me to follow him. But we agreed, let's try. So we made a theoretical study of how it might be possible to build passive houses in Europe. And Professor Bo Adamson insisted that we not only do a theoretical study, but that we really built a demonstration building of a passive house in Europe. Now you have to know that in Europe, the climate is like uh, North Japan. So it can be minus 15 degrees during the winter. So it's not so easy to build a passive house in Europe. So we had to use uh, quite a lot of insulation. Uh, it had to be quite airtight. We, we needed new uh, hand manufactured windows. We put in a ventilation with heat recovery. Uh, so it was quite a big effort to realize these very first passive houses in uh, Germany, in Darmstadt. Uh, so what you see here is a typical German row house. It's four units, each of them three stories, uh, built by private investors. It's families who live in these buildings. This was built in 1991. And the architect of this development was Professor Bott. Professor Bott, an, another uh, colleague, uh, from the architectural department, he later uh, uh, got, a, uh, got a call from Stuttgart University, and he was teaching uh, architectural arts at Stuttgart University, and that was the place uh, where Miva Mori uh, was studying. So this is, again, some link uh, to the Japanese uh, development. So this was the, the house being built uh, at the, at the uh, uh, beginning of the 1990s. Uh, uh, the next thing we did, this was uh, thought to be a research project. So we wanted to know uh, about what is it? Will it be possible to reduce the energy demand of buildings in the cold uh, German winter uh, by a significant, uh, in a significant way? Uh, so we did that research. So uh, we got some research money uh, from a uh, a German state, the state of Hesse, uh, to install monitoring equipment. So we measured all the temperatures, we measured humidity, we measured the consumption of energy. And this is one of the most important results of that measurement. What you see here is the years. This is 1991 to 1992. This is 92 to 93, 94, 95, 96. And these are all the all year consumptions. So this is what is consumed in this building. Uh, national gas for heating. This is the red, the red bar. National gas for heating. Uh, national gas for domestic hot water. And this is the uh, electricity for running washing machines and other things. And the electricity, the yellow one, for running the ventilation systems. So what you see here, that the, that the total consumption of energy is in the range of 20 kilowatt hours per square meter a year, and the heating is even less than 10 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. So now we compare that with the average German consumption. So the average German consumption, this is what you see here. This is what normally in an average German building is consumed for heating, 200 kilowatt hours. So this is down by more than a factor 10. So the whole research project was a big success. So these results have been published. And then uh, we had a very important guest from the United States of America. Uh, this is a guy, 
you might know he has been here at this university, uh, I have been told, uh, uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, his name is Amory Lovins. Amory Lovins came to visit us uh, in this demonstration building. And after his visit, we were all sitting together to have some afternoon tea, and we were uh, discussing the results, and I was discussing with Amory, and at some place, well, you know Amory, you have seen him, he's a very energetic guy, and uh, when he told me, well, Wolfgang, you are completely wrong. So I... I was a little bit shocked, so now what? He's, what's his opinion? Yeah, I'm completely wrong, so I was a little bit uh, shrinking. Uh, so so what's, uh, what, what does he what, 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 what does he not, what, what does he not like on this uh, development? Well, Wolfgang, this is not just a research project. This is the solution. Ah, so I very proud again. Uh, so he told us that now we should try to find producers to mass product all these components which are needed in the passive house, like the insulation, like the windows, like the glazing system, like the ventilation system. So all these parts which are needed to make a passive house work that shouldn't be just produced individually for each building, but it should be produced by a, uh, a big, in a big marketplace by different producers. And then uh, the cost will come down. And so with a reduced cost, uh, it could be used everywhere. So this was the idea of Amory. And well, we started that. So again, uh, we were able to convince the regional government, that's the Hess government, and they financed a small working group of uh, a few uh, architects and a few producers in order to go on with the development of the so-called cost-efficient passive house. Well, and now I make a big jump. A big jump, we are now uh, in 2013, uh, last year, and uh, show you some examples of built passive houses. This is what came out of the development. So now there are at least 50 passive house schools which have been built. Uh, a lot of social housing built in passive house because social housing have to be not expensive. It's for the poor people. Um, this is a passive house kindergarten. This is a passive house swimming hall. And this, very interesting, this is a passive house office building in the center of Vienna. It's an office building of a big financial institute called Raiffeisen. And the interesting thing of this passive house is that it's standing at the same place where had been the former OPEC building. OPEC is the oil producing countries. Now we go away with the OPEC and we put on the passive house. So this is a sign of the development which is going on in Europe right now. So now you might be curious, if this is so successful, how does it work? And I want to show you how this concept is working using this example. Uh, this example, it's an, another friend of mine, Professor Enno Schneider. He is an architect in Kassel. And this building is the very first passive house social building, which has been built in Kassel in the year 2000, built in 2000 in Kassel. Um, well, uh, it is part of a, it, it, it's part of a big European demonstration project. So the European Commission, which is the government of the whole, uh, 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 the whole continent of Europe, the European Commission uh, has research programs and they started a program uh, which was called CFIUS. CFIUS, this is an acronym for Cost Efficient Passive Houses as European Standards. And uh, 
we have been working with the European Commission quite a lot. Now, when I tell you that the European Commission is somehow the government of Europe, you might be surprised because who of all of you knows the European Commission? Yes, yeah, me, me. Yeah, I know the European Commission. So how important is the European Commission? Well, it, it, it might be as important as the as the United Nations. Eh? How important is the United Nations? Eh? So the powerful, the powerful people are still the national governments. Yeah? So the European Commission, it has some influence, but it's not the most powerful part in Europe. But the European Commission uh, financed this uh, study. So now let's look. This is a social housing project. So social houses has to be inexpensive because it's for the poor people. It's built by taxpayer money, and if you use taxpayer money, you have to be very inexpensive because otherwise the taxpayers will be very angry. So this was not an expensive building. So let's look what, what did the architect do in order to make this a passive house. So well, what we see first is insulation. So well, and it's a very simple thing to understand. If you want to keep your coffee hot, what do you do? Well, you fill it into a thermos bottle. Uh, this is insulation. You can keep the coffee hot without using any energy by filling it into a thermos bottle. And this is the principle of a passive house. You see, there are thick layers of insulation in the roof, on the bottom, in the walls. Everywhere there is not a window we have a very, very good insulation all around the building. So the building doesn't lose a lot of energy to the outside during winter time. Now there might be some questions some people ask when you have that thick insulation, what, what will happen in summer? Will it be even warmer during summer because the insulation somehow is warming your house? No, well, that's not true. Um, you have, to, you have to think about that like a physicist thinks. Uh, if you want to keep your iced tea cold, what do you do? Well, you fill the tea into a thermos bottle because the thermal bottle is keeping the, the, the tea cold. There is no energy going into the bottle. So what is keeping you warm during winter is also keeping you cold during the summer. So the same material is useful for the summer and for the winter condition. Now, insulation is very important uh, for uh, the passive house, but it's not just insulation. We have also to be very careful that all parts will be insulated well. Uh, so there are parts of a building which we call thermal bridges. So the thermal bridges, uh, these are points where the insulation might be weakened by concrete or by steel or by other materials which is going through the insulation. So we have to reduce these thermal bridges. This is also part of the passive house concept. So the third part is the passive house windows. Now what is a passive house window? No. Uh, what is a passive house window is a little bit dependent on in which climate we are in. So in the German climate, which is uh, very similar to North Japanese climate, uh, the optimal window is a triple pane window. A triple pane window with two low E coatings, which is only losing a very small amount of energy. So we have almost no energy losses but we still have energy gains from the solar radiation. So this uh, triple pane window is the best uh, solution for, uh, say, moderate cold climates. If we go to even colder climates, like, like uh, northern China or like Siberia in Russia, uh, we need even better windows, and uh, the best available windows nowadays are vacuum insulation windows, which is which is the technology of the vacuum flask uh, being used for the window. Uh, but in Japan, it's a triple pane window in northern Japan. Well, if we go to uh, the south of Japan, 
where it's, it's very hot and where uh, you mainly want to protect from too much energy during the summer, uh, a sun protection glazing is the best solution. So it's different. What kind of, of uh, uh, glazing you are using is different in uh, depending on the climate uh, you are in. So that is uh, the passive house window. Now, of course, uh, uh, the building envelope, it's not only insulated, it also has to be airtight. Well, why? Well, you might have seen, and this is uh, very easy to uh, realize, especially in hot and humid climates, so you will be aware of that. Uh, during summer, uh, you very often, in, in old houses, you very often have a problem of mold grow inside of a building structure because humid air is infiltrating through the structure and there might be condensation in the structure and this gives mold grow and structural damage to the building. So this is why a building envelope, a building envelope has to be airtight in order to avoid structural damage. And there is a fifth point, that is, of course, people in a building, they need fresh air. So it's not an option just to seal up the building to make it airtight. We need fresh air in the building. So fresh air is provided by a ventilation with heat recovery, MHR. This is the, uh, the American pronunciation for the uh, heat recovery system. So there is fresh air delivered to the building and exhaust air is removed out of a building. Mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. So these are the five elements of a passive house and these are the same elements everywhere. Uh, these are the same principles you can use in order to build passive houses which are very successful. And the surprising, the surprising thing might be that these are the five points. So there's nothing else. So this sounds too easy to be true. Yeah? It's just five elements well known. Insulation, better windows, air tightness, reduction of formal bridging and ventilation with heat recovery. It's just a very simple uh, principle. And this is a, the surprising thing. This really, really works. So now there's a lot of discussion about cost. And uh, I have heard it's also the discussion in Japan, and uh, we discussed it before the symposium, um, that there are lots of people who think uh, that has a too high upfront cost. Now, let's be honest about these developments with the cost. What I have here, that is the amount of energy which is needed for just heating the building. That's just at the moment, for the moment, look at heating. So you can have 100 kilowatt hours per square meter end year, or you can build a zero energy building which doesn't need any heating at all. That will be a, oh, say, one meter of insulation. Huh? Now it's clear uh, that in order to reduce the amount of energy you need, you will have to improve the insulation. So this is maybe five centimeters of insulation, where we have 10 centimeters, where we have 30 centimeters, where we have one meter of insulation. So the overall cost for insulating is increasing. Now this is not only the cost for insulation, it's also the cost for the windows, the cost for the ventilation system, everything, everything included. So the costs are very much increasing. So what you see here is that a zero energy building, a, ener a building which doesn't consume any energy, this might not be a good idea because it's really uh, very, very expensive. But on the other side, uh, building just a, a not very well insulated building, well, you have a downside of that, and that is the heating cost. Here we have the heating cost. So, of course, the heating costs are coming down. Yeah, so we have the highest heating cost with a less insulated building and you have of course zero heating cost with a zero heating energy building. Now this is the total amount of heating cost over the whole useful period of uh, the building and this is 
calculated in the way a bank manager would do. So it's calculated by calculating the so-called net present value. So there might be people here in this room who don't know what a net present value is. It doesn't matter. Just think about it that it is the total amount of cost you have for paying for the energy. Uh, it's, uh, it's what we, the financial sector uses for uh, comparing costs which occur at different times. So the costs which occur in, in the future, uh, in the faraway future, uh, you don't care so much about the cost which you will have in 20 years. So these costs are not as valuable nowadays. They don't have a, such a high net present value than uh, what you spend now. So this is added up in exactly that way how the financial sector does it. So this is the green curve net present value of the energy cost. Now, there are no other costs. There are costs for, say, maintenance. Yes, of course, but the maintenance costs are about the same in both cases, whether you insulate or you're not insulate. Even the maintenance cost might be lower in a good insulated house, but we, we, we won't take that into account now. Now, these are all the costs, so we can add them up. We add the investment cost and the energy cost and what you find is the red curve. So the red curve, this is the total cost. So this is what somebody who is in a resident in this building will have to pay. That is the total cost uh, of occupation in that building. And what you see now is that there is a minimum. Uh, and this minimum, this is exactly the minimum of a passive house. So the passive house is at the minimum of the total cost uh, for the overall spend in uh, such a building. And uh, this is uh, uh, quite easy to understand also for all those who are going to build new buildings. This is the best way to do uh, the investment you take. You'll have a loan, you will pay uh, interest for that loan, and you can compare the paid interest and the payback with the energy you are saving. So this is why the passive house is a very attractive solution, because it's the least cost uh, solution for building a new construction in Germany nowadays. Uh, I'm coming back to the five points, what is the important, what are the important uh, design, uh, design methods for building a passive house. Uh, I come back to uh, what Amory Lovins uh, convinced us to do. Uh, so nowadays, uh, we have a lot of different producers who offer passive house construction systems in uh, Europe. Uh, so this is a type of a, uh, just a simple brick, insulated brick structure, which is uh, distributed by the brick industry. So the brick industry have passive house bricks this is a method you can use concrete structure in order to build passive houses. It's a so-called insulated concrete form, ICF in America, very popular. Uh, so you build, this is like Lego, so you build your building like with Lego stones and it will be filled with concrete. And these are the forms and the forms will be uh, will be kept in place, so they are not removed, they, they don't have to, uh, to be re, uh, uh, removed from the side, uh, don't have to be destroyed, so this is also environmentally quite, quite uh, an interesting development. There are lots of other uh, producers who produce these passive house elements. Uh, this is another uh, construction type which is much more popular in Japan, that is a timber construction. So there are different ways of timber construction uh, filled with insulation material. So one type of insulation material you can use in passive houses is uh, the glass wool insulation or mineral wool insulation. And uh, there is some probe you can see in the exhibition outside, uh, which is produced by Isover, by the, the firm of MIG, which has been uh, helpful in organizing this event also. Um, you can also, of course, use other types of insulation. There are lots of different 
types of insulation available. Uh, what we have to keep in mind is that insulation mainly, normal insulation material mainly is just air. It's just air, what is insulating, like our clothes. It's just air. It's not depending on what kind of material you use to keep the air from moving. If the air is moving, it's not insulating, it's convection, so then this, this is a bad idea. So the air has to be kept at the place, and this is where the uh, insulation material comes in. So this is uh, what uh, the solutions which have been created for the structure of a building. Now, these are, there are already more than 100 producers in Germany. This is again uh, what uh, my uh, uh, what the speaker before me uh, told you. This is a big development of small and medium enterprises. So the small and medium enterprises, they are providing these materials which are saving energy. So this is a big shift from uh, the big industry, oil, gas, and coal, and nuclear, to small and medium enterprises who construct the energy efficient buildings. So what is our role in this? Now we help these uh, producers uh, to, to design their solutions. So this is a type of a timber frame construction uh, widely used in Germany. Now this has to be connected to the insulation of the basement. Uh, so what you see here is a specific structure how to, to make that join, how to make that join in a way that there is no extra thermal bridge. So the thermal bridge is eliminated from the whole envelope, and this is possible. And this can be done just by using your brain. So we are, we are substituting energy losses by using our brain in order to construct better construction. So this is the construction which is widely being used. Let's go to step three. Uh, yeah, you remember, I have shown you five points for construction of passive houses. Now we have seen insulation, reduction of thermal bridges. I'm going to show you what is the solution for the windows. So now we are in a cold climate. Uh, you see in the outside, there is, uh, it's a winter condition, so there's snow outside. It's minus 15 degrees on the outside. And we are in the inside. In the inside, it's 22 degrees. That, that, that sounds comfortable. But now let's look on the window. This is a standard single pane window. So a standard single pane window will have frost on the inside with minus 15 degrees outside. So it's not comfortable at all. If you put your hand on that, on that you, you will freeze on the, on the window. A not very comfortable solution. The next step was to just add another pane. Uh, so we are at a double pane window, which is better. So now we temperature on the inner side is higher, it's above frost, but you still have condensation on this side, and 14 degrees is still not very comfortable. So the next step was that uh, physicists brought in what is called a low emissivity coating. So the low emissivity coating, this is a very inexpensive process in industry uh, to coat the window with a small metal layer which is reflecting the infrared light. So this is like in the Fermer's bottle, the reflection of the infrared. Uh, so this gives a very much better window. So now we have a window with a surface temperature in the range of 18 degrees. This is much better. This was the type of glazing which has been mainly used in new construction in Germany uh, up to a date uh, in the last five years. So up to uh, uh, 2009, 2010, this type of double low E window was the mainly used window in Germany. And what happened then now? Uh, now 70% uh, of all glazings which are used in Germany, new construction and refurbishment, 70% now are already triple glazing. Triple glazing, you just add another pane uh, with also a low E layer. And now we are down to a very low heat loss and we are up to a very comfortable surface temperature. Now if you put your hand on the surface, it's 20 degree, it's as warm as your desk is. So this is not cold any longer, anymore. So this is a very comfortable situation and 
the prices of the triple glazing have come down in Germany very much. So nowadays, it doesn't matter. It's even in some parts nowadays, because this is the mainly produced window now, uh, nowadays, in some parts, if you want to get a double pane, it will be more expensive than the triple pane, because the triple pane is the standardized um, uh, mass product solution. So Amory Lovins has been exactly right. If you go to produce these elements as the normal solution, it's not going to be expensive. And this is what happened. Now, it's not just the glazing. Uh, the glazing is something which is produced by a centralized uh, industrial, um, industrial uh, fabrication. Uh, it's also uh, the uh, company of Sogobon, for example, which produces glazings. But there are some others uh, like Pilkington and Shot Glass. So there are lots of most producers of, uh, of, of glazings, but it's produced in a, in a centralized factory. Um, uh, what is locally produced is the frames. So this is a typical German wooden frame uh, which has been used most of the time. So if you have this old window with a uh, normal frame and a double glazed uh, a pane, uh, it is a heat loss window. It's still a heat loss window. So we have a lot of energy losses from the window. Now, what we did in the development of the passive house sector we moved the frame around, so now it's uh, positioned in that way, so it's much slimmer than the old one was. And we added some insulation on the outside of the frame. So now this is a very well insulated frame. And this is a triple pane glazing with a thermally insulating spacer. So at the end, what we get at the end is a window where it's not longer a heat loss window, it's a heat gain window. So we get more solar energy into the room uh, by penetrating through a window from the outside, the solar radiation, so that the, the room gets heated during winter by the solar energy and the heat losses are smaller than the heat gains. So this is what took place in the passive house revolution, part of the energy revolution in uh, Germany. So this is going to be the window of the future, and hopefully, when I'll be here next in Japan, oh, that's a condition. I'll come back to Japan only if there is a Japanese-produced passive house window. We'll need a passive house window Japanese, uh, from Japanese uh, production. So there's another advantage uh, to these better insulating windows. So. The window has a cold surface. So at the cold surface of the window, the air, the air is cooled. So now the cool air is falling down along the window and it will distribute on the floor. So you get cold feet. You might know that yeah, from, from your uh, home, yeah, that there is cold air coming down. Now, if we have a passive house window, uh, the temperature here isn't very low, so you won't get any cold feet any longer. So the comfort in a passive house is much better than uh, you are used to uh, the comfort in standard uh, buildings. It's another advantage. So now I'm coming to point number five. I won't talk a lot about air tightness because I already told you what is important, why we need a building envelope to be airtight. It's mainly to avoid structural damage. I'm not going very deep into that. But next step, uh, that is uh, what always has been a discussion everywhere. Why do we need ventilation? Why do we need ventilation? I, I won't talk about that. This is, this is why you need ventilation. <laughs> Yeah, we have a lot of emissions in a dwelling, and it's also us. Yeah? You know, we are all, also uh, giving uh, uh, smells and uh, humidity, and there is a lot of activity going on in a room where, where people are staying. And, and this is the reason why we need ventilation. So ventilation is clear, 
it's for indoor air quality. This is the main issue of ventilation. Ventilation is about indoor air quality. And I say it again, ventilation is about indoor air quality. It's not about energy. Yes, we can also improve ventilation in order to save energy, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is ventilation is for indoor air quality. This is why we need ventilation. And this is how it's done. Uh, we have fresh air. This is air coming from the outside. And the fresh air is distributed into each dwelling. So now let's look at that dwelling. Uh, this is fresh air which is ventilated into the room. Well, we have the same thing here, of course. In this, in this room where we are sitting, in this hall, this conference hall, there are fresh air supply outlets uh, because we need fresh air inside here. So this is distributed to the living room, uh, to the bedrooms, uh, to, to the working rooms, so everywhere where the people are staying. And then there is the stall air, uh, the air which is uh, coming from the kitchen, from the bathroom, from the toilets, maybe a workshop or whatever. Uh, we remove the air, we extract the air from these rooms where we have the poorest indoor air quality and bring it back outside. This is how ventilation works. Fresh air in, stall air out. Now the only trick with the passive house ventilation is that we put in something which we call a heat recovery system. A heat recovery system. Now how is that working? Well, this is what you see here. This is the extract air, the warm air coming from the kitchen, from the bathroom, from the toilet. We bring it through the heat exchanger and it's removed outside of the room. Now think about a piece of paper here in between the cold fresh air which is coming in from the outside and is supplied to the inside. These air flows are not mixed up. It's no return air. It's only fresh air from the outside. But we exchange the heat from the warm air to the cold side. And with modern heat exchangers, we can have efficiencies of this heat exchange of up to 90%. So we can bring back 90% of the heat uh, from the stall air to the fresh air. This is such a type of uh, heat recovery ventilation system. Now, there is a lot, remember, remember what I said. Ventilation is about indoor air quality. So there are a lot of issues with such a system which they have to fit for. They have to provide good indoor quality, so they shouldn't smell. Uh, so there have to be filters that you don't bring dirt into the room. Uh, these ventilators don't have to produce a lot of noise. It has to be quiet because you don't want to hear all the time something. So we are a lot of criteria for this system. This is another thing where our institute is engaged. So we are doing certification for these kinds of systems. So you can get a certificate, and in this certifi certificate, you find all the numbers. You find how high is the efficiency of the system. If you install it in your building, it's the installed efficiency. In this type, it's 75%. How high is the consumption of electricity for the ventilators? What is the operating noise? Yeah, so you get all these numbers, and you can be sure that the product Will, uh, will meet these numbers. So you can really use it in your dwelling in order to save energy and in order to have good indoor air quality. So I'm now wrapping up. That is, uh, I have been talking about better insulated wall and roof systems. So there are a lot of these systems now available on the European market. And yes, we need more of these systems and especially also in Japan we'll need a lot of these, of these construction systems. The better windows. Nowadays we have 150, this is an old slide. Nowadays we have more than 150 certified window producers, most of them small and medium-sized 
producers. These small and medium-sized producers can compete with the big plastic window producers in Germany because they have such a high quality. So this is a big chance for small and medium enterprises. So this is not only good for energy, it's not only good for changing the energy path, what IEA says, it's only also good for economy because the small and medium enterprises, those are the people who are carrying the economy. Those are the people who are innovative. So those are the people who can help us uh, to grow the economy. There are a lot of window panes which are available on the European market. Well, I'm very proud I can announce that now there is a first Chinese-made passive house window. There's a certification for a Chinese-made passive house window. And hopefully, there soon will be also Japanese-made passive house windows available for the Japanese market. We have these uh, heat recovery systems. Nowadays, it's also more than 100 systems which have been certified. This is also a product which can be easily produced by small and medium enterprises. Uh, they use uh, efficient motors which are constructed by uh, mass production of uh, bigger industry partners which are producing with very efficient uh, ventilator um, uh, units. I'm now going uh, to show you in the end of my presentation, it's a little bit less demanding, uh, I'll just want to show you some examples so that you uh, uh, keep in mind uh, what we can do uh, with that type of technology. Uh, this example you have already seen on the first slide, but this is now a big picture of this. Uh, these are uh, some 350 social housing units which have been built by a company in Innsbruck. It's, uh, it's the biggest, um, the biggest uh, construction company uh, and, and um, uh, investor company uh, in Innsbruck building houses, social housing. Uh, they had built that in uh, 2004. Some of you have been visiting uh, this uh, settlement already. Uh, now you have to know that this company, after they built these uh, passive houses in Innsbruck in 2005, uh, they decided that in future they'll only build passive houses. So this company is going to only build passive houses in the future, reducing the energy uh, demand by 80%. So that's another example, and uh, yes, it's easy to see, this is not a passive house. Uh, this is an old postal building. It's near to the station in Bolzano. Bolzano is uh, the capital of the uh, South uh, Tyrolean state. It's a state in Italy. And uh, so uh, we wanted to refurbish this building. And uh, they made a competition, a competition where they invited uh, a, a combination of a constructor and, uh, and uh, a, a architect in order to, to bid for the refurbishment of that building. It should be refurbished and there should be two more uh, floors added. And the investor uh, is the Ministry of Energy uh, of South uh, Tyrolean State. And they gave uh, the contract uh, to one bidder, uh, and that was organized by, Ma by architect Michael Trebus. So Michael Trebus organized the cheapest bid. He didn't tell them that he was going to build a passive house, because if they would have known that this is going to be a passive house, they would have told him, oh, well, okay, let's, let's not do that. Let's remove the extra insulation and so on. It will be even cheaper. No? But he didn't tell them. So he, he made the, the cheapest bid, including the passive house. And now uh, it looks like this. So this is what has been uh, constructed. Uh, this is the first passive house ministry worldwide. Now the ministry is residing, the energy ministry is residing in a passive house. It was the first refurbishment of an office building into passive house construction. Uh, now, this building is heated by a 20 kilowatt natural gas stove, and uh, the heating 
the heating um, uh, handicraft who installed this system, he very proudly, he put it on his internet page. He said that that kind of heating plant we have been using in single family homes before, and now we are heating the whole ministry with just that very small unit. Now, the uh, South Tyrolean Energy Minister, now we are very proud that they have a passive house. Yeah? So that is uh, interesting also. Yeah? Now we are very proud that they have that passive house, which is very comfortable, which uses a, a, a very small amount of energy. Now, how can we, uh, how can we do all these development? And well, there is a key method for designing passive houses, that is, if you design a passive house, you, you try to keep the energy balance in the mind. Now, this is something what physicists do and engineers do, but most likely architects don't like very much. They don't like to calculate their energy balance uh, uh, during the design of, 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 of their houses. So uh, that is why we created a tool which is called the PHPP. Oh, what is that? PHPP. It's the Passive House Design or Planning uh, Package. That is uh, a package of software uh, where you yeah, do the following. Uh, who is an architect here? I'll be so, so, such. Oh, there are more architects there. Uh, you know SketchUp? Yes, yeah? every architect knows SketchUp. So you do your first draft using SketchUp. Uh, very, it's, it's very fast, sir. It's very fast. So just have a drawing and put, put it up, and you do your first draft using SketchUp. I also tried it myself. I'm not an architect. I'm a physicist. So I'm not, I'm not uh, used to use such types of, of, of tools. But uh, interestingly, this is fun. This is really fun to build up your building with SketchUp. It's very fast. You, you just, uh, five minutes and you are at, at that place. It, it, it's really, it's five minutes, five or 10 minutes. And now uh, there is a software which identifies your windows. It identifies the walls, the roof, and so on. And it's very accurate in identifying it. Well, there, there may be some mistakes, uh, maybe that he, he calls a part of that outside structure also a roof. You have to remove that then, have to call it. It's not a roof, it's something else. But it takes only uh, two minutes uh, to, to correct this identification. And now you just uh, have one click, one click more, and you will import all these data into the energy balance calculation. The energy balance is calculated, you get your result, this is your heating demand. Oh, woo, that's too high, much too high. So now you can go on and can change the amount of insulation. You can change the window. You can change the size of the window. You can rotate the building and calculate it again. And in this way, you can calculate for your house. And at the end, it will be a passive house. So this is a tool architects can use in order to improve their building designs. You remember I've been talking about a famous European project which was called Cepheus. If you ask the European Commission, they'll tell you that that was at least one of the most important projects which was ever uh, financed by the European Union. And now we have another one that is called PASREC. PASREC, this is Passive House Regions. And uh, these are beacon projects um, and uh, they are including uh, some uh, cities you know. Uh, the city of Frankfurt, the city of Brussels, the city of Heidelberg. Now, what is common of these cities? Well, one thing which is common, it is when you are traveling to Europe, you will visit these cities. Eh? You are in Heidelberg, you, you go to Frankfurt because it's the big airport, and you will be in Brussels because it's the European capital. Uh, but there is something else which is common of these cities. They already have passive house mandatory. So if you build a new building in Frankfurt, it has to be a passive house. And if you build a new building in Brussels from 2016 onwards, it will have to be a passive house. 
So this is already a beacon for what will happen in the European, in the whole European Union, uh, beginning from 2019. The European Commission proclaimed that from 2019, in all European states, in all European regions, only nearly zero energy buildings are allowed to be built. And that's an acronym for passive house. So beginning in 2019, in Europe, only passive houses will be built, oh, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, I already told you that the power in Europe is not with the European Commission. The power in Europe is still with the national governments. Uh, so the national governments have, of course, to decide on their own what they are going to do. And, well, I don't know exactly what uh, the national governments will be deciding because the national governments are, almost, are always under a lot of pressure from lobby groups. There's a lot of lobbying going on. Uh, at that time. So this is what you hear sometimes from Germany. If you hear from Germany, oh, people are complaining about high electricity prices. It's not true. This is just uh, misinformation coming from some vested interest groups. Yeah? So we, the people, the people like that type of development because they are spending less money than they have been spending before. So this is why the European Commission, why the European Commission started the Beacon regions, the Pass Track regions, because now the European Commission is demonstrating that this is working. So the regions of Brussels, of Frankfurt, of Heidelberg, they will be successful. So they will have higher living standard than all the other regions. So the European Commission can tell, look, this is working. So this is a good idea to go for the better efficiency. This is a European project. Now, there are, of course, much more details to energy efficiency than just uh, housing. So uh, energy for housing is quite high. It's the highest consumption uh, we have, the heating and the air conditioning systems. They have the highest consumption of all other things. But, uh, of course, also computers are consuming electricity. So this is an old an old uh, display uh, with a quite high consumption of energy. Uh, so now that's the latest uh, development we have, which is called electronic ink. Electronic ink doesn't consume any energy for the display. Well, uh, it's the same with your, your, your papers. Uh, just one, so what is the energy consumption of that piece of paper? Uh, displaying uh, uh, the picture on it. There's no energy consumption. And that is the same we have with electronic ink. So the electronic ink screen doesn't consume energy. So if you have such an electronic ink reader, uh, you can uh, place it on your desk and after two weeks it's still running and it's not consuming any energy. So this is the modern way of reducing the energy demand of our systems and that will work with everything. Another example, uh, this um, mobile phone, uh, this smartphone, it has a, a computer inside, and the computer inside of this phone uh, is, has much higher capacity than the computers me and Professor Bo Adamson and Professor Kamata used in order to calculate the first passive houses. So we can do all those calculations just with that smartphone, which just, just consumes one watt. So this is the, the, this is the real uh, the real innovation, the innovative things going on, having uh, highly energy efficient uh, components. Now, some people say that this is electronic ink is just black and white. No, it's not true. There are also <coughs> color electronic ink uh, systems. So <laughs> that will be the upcoming next generation of, of displays using electronic ink uh, without any energy consumption anymore. What about the spread of passive houses? Well, uh, some people ask, why is that being used in Germany only, and why isn't it also used in the US, which, which uh, uh, was to be the most innovative country worldwide? Uh, yes, it's true. The United States of America, they had had a very good development in the late 70s and in the 80s, towards sustainable energy. There was a American president called Jimmy Carter, 
Uh, he very much engaged in sustainable energy development. And uh, they built so-called super-insulated buildings. Uh, they just made one mistake. Uh, and I, I, I urge you not to do the same mistake. They were only dependent on governmental money. So in order to do that research, they needed governmental money. And now the government changed. It changed from, you remember who it was? It changed from Jimmy Carter to Ronald Reagan. And he stopped the whole program. So all these people out of jobs, out of uh, profession, uh, so that stopped the whole development in the United States of America. Some of these people were coming to Europe, like Robert Hastings, and working together with the European part. And uh, that's one of the reasons uh, in America, in America there was no incentive for doing that development, but in Europe there still was. So that is one of the reasons why it started in Europe. There are several other reasons also. But after it has been successful in Europe, it's going back to the US. So nowadays, uh, we have a lot of passive house communities in the US, in Canada, in Mexico, even in Southern America. And there are worldwide passive houses being built, uh, also in People's Republic of China. Of course, in Japan, Miva Mori will talk about the Japanese experiences. In all, in all continents, we have uh, passive houses uh, being built. Uh, in Australia, and even, even in Antarctica, there is a Belgish research center built as a passive house in Antarctica. So we have the passive house already worldwide. It's everywhere. It can be adapted to every climate, also the hot and humid climates. Uh, the Austrian embassy in Jakarta is a passive house. So it's already been realized. It's a good solution. Uh, it can be used in all parts of the world. So now, of course, if you want to build passive houses in other parts of the world, we have to look how to do that. It's clear that a passive house in Himalaya will look different from a passive house in Jakarta. Well, that's completely clear. It's the same principle, but the house in Himalaya will need much more insulation. It has to be insulation of 40 centimeters like that. The house in Jakarta, it will be enough to have 10 centimeters, 12 centimeters of insulation. So this, this world map is showing you the world in a little bit a different manner. Uh, this world map is showing you how much insulation do you need in order to build a passive house. Uh, so you need a lot of insulation in uh, Sweden, in, in Norway, uh, in Himalaya, northern part of Japan, uh, and you need uh, almost no insulation in the highlands of Mexico, uh, some parts of Africa. Yeah? So these are what we call the lucky climates. In these lucky climates, almost all buildings are passive houses anyhow, because you don't have to heat and you don't have to cool. Now, if it comes to some desert climates like Sahara or the Arabic desert, we need more insulation again, because we have to insulate for the heat coming in. So this was a result of a study which has been financed by the German Foundation for the Environment. There's a German Foundation for the Environment, and they financed this study, which is published. You can uh, look for this study on the internet. I will show you later where you can find it. Uh, so this is uh, giving you some ideas uh, what amount of insulation, for example, will be needed in the northern part of Japan, yeah. and now we are more to uh, the Tokyo region, and when you come to the southern part of Japan, there will be less, uh, there will be less insulation needed. Uh, we also looked for what is the appropriate window. So in the cold regions, I already, I already told you, uh, it may be a vacuum window. So the vacuum window is what is needed in northern Finland, uh, northern parts of Norway. Well, not a lot of people living in these areas. Yeah? That's, uh, that's only a few people, a few, a few hundred thousand people living in these very cold areas. 
Now, there is a cold area, which is northern part of Japan, uh, northern part of China, uh, middle part of Sweden and Norway, uh, the uh, northern part of the Midwest in the United States, and most, most countries in, in Canada, most states in Canada. Uh, in this part, uh, we, we need very well insulated triple pane uh, low E windows. Uh, even in some places, you, we, we might need quadruple pane windows. And then there is the moderate cold climates, most parts of northern Japan, uh, Germany, England. Uh, this, these are the crowded uh, populations uh, we have. And there is a moderate warm climate. That's the rest of Japan, uh, southern Europe, uh, uh, parts of Asia, uh, a lot of parts of, uh, of uh, uh, America. And then uh, there are the hot climates, you see here, and the, the lucky climates, the yellow ones, uh, where uh, it's, it doesn't depend very much on the window. You, you can choose whatever you want, but you might need some shading, of course. Uh, the wet climates, these are shown in these uh, parallel lines. So these are the climates where we also have to look for dehumidification. So that's also part of this international study we have done. Now, in order to spread the knowledge about the Passive House, there is an international Passive House Association. So the International Passive House is, is, uh, uh, Association is giving information, is communicating about Passive Houses, is developing uh, Passive House educational material, is organizing meetings, and so on. So we, we really invite you uh, to be part of that international development. Uh, Japan uh, uh, would be a, a very good partner in this overall development and in this international network uh, to spread the Passive House knowledge. One thing uh, the International Passive House Association does is uh, it creates Passipedia. In the Passipedia, you find information for the public just information like I gave you here, but of course you have seen. Each of the slides I have had, I could have talked another hour on each of the slides, on the details of the glazing, on the details of the frame, on the ventilation system, and so on. So there are informations you can just get from passipedia.org. Passipedia.org, you find this information freely available for everybody. And then there is a part two, that is a part for the architects, um, the engineers, uh, the producers of material, uh, which gives detailed information of how to solve specific problems, which is not uh, in public interest, but which is needed by the architects. So this is for the members of the International Passive House uh, Association. We are also organizing uh, educational uh, courses. That was started in 2008. Now, most of you might think why education. So at the moment, uh, the, your main uh, task is to spread the knowledge, to, to just tell people that they can use passive houses. But I can tell you, this was the experience we have had in Germany, uh, it will grow very fast. So there will be, in the next one, two upcoming years, you will lack of those people who are skilled to do that job. So you need more people who are skilled in that job. So you need to have education. Uh, the education should be, of course, at the universities also. We have a lot of university partners who are providing uh, this education so that the newly educated architects already know about that. But there also has to be, of course, professional education, uh, which is for those architects and those engineers who are already in their job. And this is what we do with the international association. So there is a growing number of educated passive house designers, uh, passive house consultants uh, all around the world. This is taking place everywhere in the United States, in Mexico, in Canada, in Korea. Uh, and also in Japan, Miva Mori uh, will talk about that later. So this is my last slide, and yeah, that is uh, what, what uh, uh, professors uh, uh, seem to do. They talk a long time, so that's now my last slide. So uh, that's, uh, you can 
uh, have your coffee then after that slide. Um, uh, I'm just uh, telling you one of the other activities, what we are doing uh, upcoming next week, uh, end of next week, there is the International Passive House Conference. It's already the 18th International Passive House Conference. Uh, this time it takes place in Aachen. Uh, Aachen was uh, some 1,050 years ago, that's a long time, 1,050 years ago, it was the capital of Europe. It was in the time of Charlemagne, uh, Charlemagne, the big emperor who was, uh, uh, who, who was uh, 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 all over Europe. Uh, and the Aachen people, they are still proud uh, that they have been the uh, former capital of Europe. Uh, the uh, International Passive House Conference will take place here. We normally have uh, some 1,000 uh, participants uh, coming from all around the world. Uh, we have simultaneous translations to a lot of languages, including, of course, English, but this time also French, also Chinese, and for the first time this time, there is a Japanese uh, simultaneous translation in the Passive House Conference, <laughs> uh, because there are a lot of Japanese people coming to the conference, and uh, this will be a possibility to spread the knowledge about Passive House uh, from uh, the experience of all uh, the speakers which come from all around the world. Thank you so much for being so patient uh, for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Feist. 改めて大きな拍手をお願いいたします。